Hello everyone, welcome back. This is pretty unusual, even by our standards. Um, I'm sure a couple of you have spotted what this is, but it's not quite a one-off. There are a couple of others in existence in Australia, which is a it's sort of a clue to its origin. So this is a an automatic pistol, a machine pistol. Um, some people have referred to this as an early personal defense weapon, um, but a PDW, at the end of the day, can just be a normal pistol. Um, there are different definitions of that term. What they mean, of course, is um, an automatic or select fire weapon that's compact, can be carried by support personnel, uh, that kind of thing, as a, well, personal defense weapon, not a primary weapon for infantry fighting or whatever. That's what they mean. And this thing would fit that niche. Insofar as it is select fire, there is a weird selector switch here, which is extremely stiff. Okay. So when it's fully up as it was just now, it's on, it's on automatic mode. When it's in the middle position, round about here, it's semi-automatic. Now I can't get this to reliably operate in that mode, but it is old, it is worn, it has been through trials and messing about. And then down there is safe. Now, before I go on with technical features, I really need to name check the designer. This is Russell Shepard Robinson's SR11. So Shepard, uh, Shepard was his middle name, Robinson was his, was his last name, and he used SR rather than RR or RSR as his model designation system, because um, Robinson was a somewhat prolific designer. Um, if you have seen my book on British bullpups, we have a bit on Australian um, bullpups and his wacky shoulder fired weapon that I won't go into detail on because you never know it might show up on this channel in the future. Um, he, had, he had a machine gun, he had a, a sort of anti-aircraft cannon type uh, design and he had this thing and it's uh, predecessor design, um, sometimes called the Robbie gun, apparently. And the concept of all of his designs was around constant recoil. So to just explain uh, right away what that means, the idea is that the working parts of the gun, in this case, a big heavy pistol slide, take the magazine out, are always in motion and never hit the back of the receiver, or in this case, the frame, because that imp recoil impulse, that momentum of the, of the heavy steel slide hitting the frame is what really causes a gun to kick up at the front, muzzle rise, whatever you want to call it. So if you can come up with a clever uh, harnessing of, of physics so that the bolt or the slide is always in motion and never clonks into the back of the gun, that takes out one of the most problematic aspects of recoil. So that's what he was trying to achieve. He did achieve it with his machine gun, with his shoulder fired, uh, over the shoulder fired rifle thing. Um, did he achieve it with this? Well, I had to engage the services of a couple of engineers on this, because it's way above my ken as to whether it works. So we'll, we'll, you'll have to wait a bit longer uh, until I tell you that answer, I'm afraid. Back to the gun. So as you've already seen, it's a pretty funky design. We have this tubular telescoping but stock, this is in its extended position. If you press here, it's a little hard to do with just finger, but I should be able to get it to go. There we go. It will telescope in. I won't push it all the way in because it gets stuck, but it will telescope into that position. So roughly half, half length. Um, it's not great. It's not very positive with the way it locks in. It's easy to pop it all the way out or to shove it too far in. Uh, there's, a, there's a rib along the bottom so that the, this section is guided into this section. It just telescopes together. Weird flat sort of butt plate thing <laughs> um, with, a, with a crescent shape to it, which is kind of bizarre, but I believe that's just for purchase to unscrew it because it does a double function as a cleaning rod put a bit of flannelette on there and clean your barrel. Don't think it's also an oil bottle. 
but it could have been. It's got a, a leather washer under here, so it's possible you could store a bit of oil in there to help with cleaning. Uh, so much for the buttstock, uh, such as it is. It's not really a buttstock. It's, it would be a real, you know, it's better than not having a buttstock, but it's not a, a, not a proper one. Uh, nor does it fold or get any shorter than that. So it doubles the length of the pistol. Yeah, well, this isn't a review, so I'll move on. It does, uh, it simply threads into the frame. So we can actually we'll pop that off for the moment and set that aside. We've seen the magazine. The magazine's a little curious. It has no, this one anyway, one of the others has an extended floor plate. It has a very flush floor plate. Um, and if we then look at uh, where it interfaces, before we set it aside again, there's no magazine catch. So this, this here is actually a device for kicking out the magazine at the end of a string of, of fire. It's not a magazine catch per se. Uh, it's a magazine retainer, but there's there's no way to manually remove the magazine with it. I guess if the if the magazine was not such a tight fit, perhaps if you were to pull forward on that, it would it would let it drop. But it's in, it's not easily accessible. It's not meant to be for quick removal of the magazine. The gun's supposed to do that itself. So when it runs out of ammunition, um, I can't simulate it because this this device no longer functions correctly. But the idea is with the magazine inserted. On the last shot, when the slide slams forward, then the magazine is supposed to get kicked out. Doesn't work on this. The magazine is far too tight a fit. Um, and I don't think the little lever inside here that's attached to these, this weird catch is sprung enough to actually do the job. Um, Having said that, if we were to load this up with ammunition and fire it, we're not gonna do that, it's basically unique. Maybe it would function, I don't know. So we've already got two curious aspects, a, a weird rudimentary buttstock and an auto-ejecting magazine, if that ever worked, which I guess it must have done. Um, now, allegedly that was feedback from Australian soldiers who were uh, fighting in Southeast Asia uh, in the war. So this is, this is 1943, this is designed in 1944, finalized in 1945, and feedback from Australian and apparently Canadian soldiers as well was something compact, something automatic, again, a bit like that PDW roll, and something where you could, you reduce the reload time to the absolute minimum. You do that with auto-eject magazine, very, very rare in firearms design, historically or today. Can't think of anything else that auto-ejects the magazine. Um, clips that ought to eject. Obviously, we have the M1 Garand, we have uh, the Manlecker clip system, but a box magazine that is kicked out of the gun, very, very unusual. And then the other thing was, and this was part of the requirement, uh, revised in 1944, so this was to a, um, an Australian um, military specification, I think it was 24 separate requirements. Um, and it almost seems to have been designed around this gun. But anyway, the other aspect was when you finish firing, it must, hold open in the ready to fire position. So you fire it, it kicks out the magazine and it's in the, in the held open position. That of course is not unusual. An awful lot of firearms hold themselves open ready for the next magazine, but they don't knock out their own empty magazine. The magazine was designed to be as disposable as possible. Um, and this is certainly a bit quite rudimentary, quite lightweight. Uh, because they're obviously not retaining their magazines because you can't because it's flying out the bottom of the gun, presumably at a fair pace. But anyway, you fire it, it locks open, you simply slam in the next magazine and they reckon they could get the reload time or the gap between firing down to half a second, which is pretty remarkable. And it gets kind of even weirder from there. Um, so one aspect of this ambitious constant recoil idea was that open bolt operation. So the slide starts from the rear, flies forward, picks up a round, chambers it and fires it, just like a lot of submachine guns do. And that sort of preloads uh, or, or smooths out the recoil impulse. It doesn't technically reduce the recoil, but you feel it over a longer period of time. 
I mean, that's, you know, an open bolt pistol. That's one way of achieving that. And that's probably the main, actually the main selling point of this thing. But the other um, patented aspect of this, now, uh, Russell Robinson did not patent this until 1970, many, many years later. So he still thought it was viable. Um, my engineer friends, think not, <laughs> is this helical fluted barrel. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, see that. It's like having rifling. It's like, it's like Superman wearing his pants on the outside of his um, costume. This is like wearing its rifling on the outside of the barrel. Really bizarre to look at. And if I close, put the barrel in the firing position and show you that, you should be able to see that there are spiral grooves matching the spiral grooves on the outside of the barrel. So the barrel rotates, I'll show you that as well. The interface of those two sets of grooves means that the barrel has to rotate. Now that's not for locking the, the breech shut. There are rotating barrel pistols that use a rotating uh, lock-up system to hold in all that pressure. This doesn't do that. This uses a heavy slide to keep it shut and a, and a reasonably strong spring. Again, just like a submachine gun. What they're actually for, brace yourselves for this, is to counteract the spin of the bullet, which Russell Robinson and presumably some other people thought would, depending on which way your rifling goes, would impart a twist on firing. So you're, you're trying to fire your machine pistol and the spin of the bullet in the rifling grooves, it's, it's exerting force on the grooves, the lead bullet, and that's twisting the whole gun to the side. Now that's technically true. Um, now, one of our, our friends did a, a stream of calculations that are well beyond my ken. Uh, we might show you those on screen for comedy value. And the, va the value in um, uh, the value at the bottom, the, the, the result of you know, what actual effect there is, is laughably tiny. So, <laughs> kind of spoiler skipping to the end slightly, this works, but it needn't have bothered. <laughs> It doesn't, we think, and I sort of intuitively suspected this anyway, but um, those who know how to, how to do maths um, confirmed it. It's, it's a little bit like the Blish lock device. If you're familiar at all with the Thompson, the early Thompson submachine gun, there was supposed to be a friction locking system in that, and it turned out that didn't actually... It worked if you scaled it up to artillery size, but it's the other way around, it came from artillery. But at the scale of the amount of molecules sort of trying to bond together at that scale, it didn't really work. Well, it's, this is a bit like that, I think, in that this patented feature doesn't, it works, but why? <laughs> but having said that, this, the rotating barrel and the sort of delay or the smoothing out of the recoil impulse in, uh, created by the engagement of the grooves would still have an effect. So um, John and Derek, who are the, the guys that helped me with this, uh, are pretty confident that both things, the open bolt arrangement with a heavy slide and the spring and the rotating barrel engaging with the slide, all of that would help smooth out the recoil and make this thing, if not constant recoil, then nearly constant recoil. And the trials results seem to bear that out. On automatic fire, this thing was, was very effective. Uh, the problem was, and they probably should have seen this coming, much like with a Sten gun or something, the big heavy slide clonking forwards creates the opposite problem of it hitting the back. It actually causes the nose of the gun to dip, meaning that you're accurate, inaccurate in the other direction. Having explained the, the problem of a, of a slide or a bolt hitting the back of a gun, it, as it actually turned out in, in trials in 1945, the opposite problem occurred. Um, and if you if you fired or dry fired a, something like a, a Sten, and it was a Sten Mark V that was used as a, one of the control or, or, or sort of um, comparator weapons, uh, the other being the Polish MCEM Machine Carbine Experimental Model Two. Uh, there are two MCEM twos. Don't get confused. Um, but those those two were used against this conventional submachine guns. Essentially, MCEM is a bit unusual, but more conventional than this thing. Um, the opposite problem was found. And so all very well trying to prevent the bottoming out, but in semi-automatic fire, they found that the clonk of the slide bottoming out at the front 
would make the, the muzzle of the gun dip and so throw off your aim downward instead of upward. Uh, so for that reason, it was less accurate than those two uh, machine carbines or submachine guns. A really bizarre bit of kit. Um, it does have some interesting markings as well. So we have here, at least on this one, we actually have uh, manufactured Lithgow, New South Wales, the Lithgow, famous Lithgow Armoury in, in Australia, which is still going, unlike Enfield, which is also referenced on here. It just says, and Enfield, and Fort Halstead, England. So Fort Halstead is still a, a, an interesting uh, military adjacent site today, funnily enough. Um, but it was where the Enfield Design Department moved in 1942. So in 44, when this was being developed, Fort Halstead was sort of Enfield, although Enfield is itself referenced on here, that being the Royal Small Arms Factory at Enfield. And then on the other side, we have what I've already told you, which is SR Model 11 Machine Carbine is the term that uh, Robinson gave this. So we should really call it the SR 11 Machine Carbine. This is what makes it a carbine. And then a pat the patent numbers on the bottom there. So we can show you uh, the 1970 patent, certainly. I don't think I was able to find all of the patents for this uh, in the time available. We have an ejection port on the top for the spent cases. You can see part of the recoil spring that's wrapped around the barrel there. Uh, a lot of overhang when the barrel is in its forward, well, the, well, the barrel and slide are in their forward position. Results in a lot of overhang at the back there. There's the ejector that rides under the slide, kicks out the empty case. Slightly weird design with the back strap here being made of carved wood and set into the frame. Uh, I should also say that the first design of this didn't have enough mass in the slide, and so they had to add this overhang and a longer slide to have enough mass for it to function in the way that I've described reliably. So there's another interesting figure involved other than uh, Russell Robinson himself, which is Major J.E.M. Hall, who was uh, Chief of the Army Small Arms Department in um, Australia. He was involved in coming up with the specification back in 44, uh, 43-44, and then he was involved in the testing that was done in 1946 um, with this configuration, with the heavier slide, because he'd been transferred to the UK and was working, or would stay there and carry on, and worked on the 280 project um, for the EM1, the EM2, designed his own bullpup rifle, the EM3, um, so he, he's quite an interesting character to me for obvious reasons. So if this thing works, but sort of for the wrong reasons, why didn't it go anywhere? Well, the usual excuse is there's a war on, but plenty of designs did get finalized and adopted during or immediately after the war. Um, this was, as, as, I, as I mentioned, found to not be as fully effective as the Sten. Now, uh, British and Commonwealth doctrine at the time did emphasize semi-automatic fire in the first instance. So if you're brand new whiz-bang firearm is less effective than your existing firearm in one mode, that's one reason to not adopt it. No matter how controllable, you know, it could be like Robocop's uh, automatic pistol from, from the movie, seemingly not rising at all. If it can't fire automatic, uh, sorry, semi-automatic aimed fire, then it's not of any use for adoption. So that, that was clearly, I think, a factor. And ultimately, by the time they'd worked out a version that worked optimally um, using a special heavy alloy slide, this was in 1948, so the time frame is drifting, the war has ended now, the imperative for a niche weapon like this is maybe drifting away as well. Uh, Russell Robinson moves to the United States, has sort of moved on from the project effectively, and Britain has decided that it's going to adopt uh, the Patchett machine carbine, or as you will probably know it, the Sterling submachine gun, which gives you, if we just screw this back on. Uh, so we have a 14 round magazine, but the final version was supposed to have something more like 30 rounds. If you look at this, the sort of form factor of this, is it really that much less, uh, more convenient than something like a Sterling, given that it's also less capable? They clearly decided that, that it wasn't. So that's the SR11. If you'd like to know more about this and where I got some of the facts for, 
for this from, um, do check out the article by N.R. Parker in Small Arms Review, which is well worth a, uh, a dig through anyway. So that's the website, Small Arms Review. Um, they have a, a journal, a magazine as well. And there's a, a fairly detailed article on the ve development of this with some photos of the examples that are in Australia. Um, so feel free to follow that up. Okay, guys, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed that one. As always, you know where we are hopefully by now with our, our three sites that you can visit if you're in the UK or visiting the UK. Otherwise, our social media, we have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, and I never remember to say this, so do like and subscribe as well. And uh, you can also see me over on the GameSpot channel talking nonsense about guns. But we'll see you again next time on the Royal Armouries channel.